Good morning. I'd like to thank the Center for International Business, Education, and Research here at George Washington University for bringing us a lecture from Dr. Reed Click. Dr. Click is an Associate Professor of International Business and International Affairs here at George Washington University. He received his MBA and PhD degrees in Economics and International Business from the University of Chicago. Professor Click is an expert on international finance and risk management. He's published one of the leading textbooks uh, in the area of international corporate risk, the theory and practice of international financial management. His research focuses on the topic of today, political and financial risk, especially the linkages among and creation of money, price changes, exchange rates, and firm value. Professor Click is a consultant to many international organizations and firms talking about the very topic we're going to hear today. So we are very lucky to have him here. Please join me in welcoming Professor Click. Well, thank you, Professor Riddle, for that overly flattering introduction. I'm, pl I'm pleased to be here and talk to you today for a little bit about political risk indicators and analysis. I know that you've had some discussion in your class up to this point about that. Uh, and so I have some comments on what the general nature of the profession is in the area. And at the end, I'll have time to take some of your questions. And so hopefully we can have a little bit more of a discussion going as well. By way of introduction, I present what I think is a roughly typical approach to thinking about political risk. Uh, th this is from a recent publication by an old hand in the field. The term political risk by itself refers to the possibility that political decisions or political or social events in a country will affect the business climate in such a way that investors will lose money or not make as much money as they expected when the investment was made. That sentence captures an asymmetry. If you think about the nature of business, you think about possible wins and losses, gains and losses. This focuses almost exclusively on possible losses. Well, in contrast, country risk is of larger scale incorporating economic and financial characteristics of a system, along with the political and social, in the same effort to forecast situations in which foreign investors will find problems in specific national environments. And so country risk is big and incorporates a lot more than political risk. The second sentence here actually captures another feature of the debate in this area. The mentioning of foreign investors basically points out that there might be some liability of foreignness in the sense that any of these political actions might end up disproportionately affecting the foreign investors rather than all investors in the country. And so we'll mention that a couple of times, but I'm giving a sense of uh, what's going on. And I think that if you start with that definition and then go to the main working framework that I think most people in the area have discussed, a simple statement that country risk is basically the summation of one component for political risk and one component for economic and financial risk. This component for economic and financial risk is very quantitative. Uh, and in fact, there's not necessarily an asymmetry here. Most of the work in the area of finance has been about exchange rate risk, right? Well, there's a risk that the foreign currency will depreciate, right? Well, there's a risk that the foreign currency will appreciate, right? And so if you've got losses with a depreciation, then you have gains with an appreciation, and you might rightly think that uh, the, there is symmetry between the two, right? Uh, the quantitative elements can expand well beyond this if you're worried about interest rate risk, if you're worried about inflation risk. These are all variables that can be measured. Uh, and then I think there are other quantitative variables if you start to worry about those risks in general, but you might be able to look at what the quantity of international reserves at the central bank is. You might have some sense of how exports and imports might be affected in case of an exchange rate change or in case there would be limitations on the ability to convert from one currency to another. This is a fascinating area, but not the topic of discussion for today. 
Instead, well my, well, my chief purpose is to advertise the fact that we have entire courses about this, right? Uh, you can take my international business finance class next year and learn all about that. Uh, the topic for today is on the political risk. This is a more difficult area to investigate because uh, the, the quantitative analysis is restrained by data availability problems. And so in contrast to something like foreign exchange risk, you've got an exchange rate and you measure not only the exchange rate changes but also the effect on your company. Well, what about expropriation? Well, there, there is data on expropriation, but uh, for a particular country in a particular year, for a particular industry, for a particular firm, you're basically down to nothing. I think that the notion of expropriation, the government basically takes away your assets, uh, is long established and people spend a lot of time thinking about this, but the availability of data is limited such that what you're really worried about is the probability of expropriation and if no expropriation ever happens then it looks like it's never a risk and we know that that's not true. And so the main outline for my talk is to consider these three types of ratings. First, a, com a composite country risk rating, essentially the country risk, right? Political risk and all of the financial and economic risks, uh, but without a disaggregation into components. Secondly, this component risk rating analysis aggregated into country risk, so that we'll start with smaller building blocks and then add them up at the end. Uh, and finally, uh, some, well, some institutions and agencies that think about political risk ratings only uh, and possibly to their detriment because the political risk is related to the economic and financial risk. And so uh, for the first category, I basically start with where a lot of the activity is these days. This is a useful starting point because most people recognize something about rating agencies. We're basically talking about bond ratings or even if a bond doesn't exist, it's the country rating or sovereign rating. Uh, typically for a country that's international, sorry, that's interested in borrowing internationally so that they would seek a rating to convey to potential bond buyers uh, the level of risk associated with buying a bond from that country. Moody's, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch all have rating scales with 20 to 25 notches, and you kind of see them listed here. A country like the United States is routinely rated triple A by all of these, uh, but some of our neighbors are not, and, and most of the developing countries are not. And so the distance between a triple A rating and, say, a triple B rating is an indication of the risk associated with a particular bond. Now, because this is basically geared around financial instruments, we're concerned mostly with the probabilities of default. Uh, again, this is an area where the absence of a default doesn't really mean that there was never no risk of this before. And we know that countries do default, and so an entire industry has grown up kind of thinking about the nature of defaults. If I, as an American, buy a bond issued by a foreign country, uh, what's the probability that I won't get my money back? Technically, this is also net of recoveries. After all, we know they may not pay me now, but maybe in uh, five years, they'll find some money and settle for pennies on the dollar, something like that. This is a growing industry. I think almost all of the advances in the analytics in the industry have come very recently. You can imagine that as more countries are opening up to global capital flows, there's been an increased need for countries to be rated. Now, that seems like a very narrow question. Uh, and so to put some more general applications into this, I want to point out that these agencies consider an awful lot of information just to arrive at one particular rating. And in the field, most of the lingo centers around ability and willingness. And although I don't think anybody's directly mapped these, 
the, no the notion about ability is, does the country have the ability to repay? And so it's tied somehow to their wealth or somehow to their income, somehow to their gross national product. Uh, and so if you have an ability to pay, it looks like the probability of default is much lower. I think more directly, if you have a very high quantity of international reserves in the central bank, then it looks like you have an ability to pay the debt uh, on time uh, and, and without problems. But that was not sufficient as a way to start forecasting defaults or adequately explaining past defaults. So most of the industry has also considered not only the ability to repay, uh, but the willingness to repay. Is the country willing to repay? And that this is a more political component. I think about the analysis of the ability to pay the debt as an economic and financial concern. But I think about the willingness to pay as a political concern. Does the government have the strength to pay? Is the government facing some opposition in the distribution of resources? Uh, and so all of these agencies have quantitative models, and they don't really release these models. Uh, they have quantitative models to process data on, say, international reserves or the amount of debt that's outstanding. Uh, but that they've viewed this as not completely adequate, and so they use some judgment, and they may incorporate other variables about uh, factionalization of the, the political scene uh, into these kinds of models, but they've expanded this to include judgment as well. So when they release a rating, they don't tell you exactly what went into this. They'll tell you the kinds of things that go into this, but. Uh, I guess as some level of, well, because some level of judgment is required, uh, they're not going to tell you what all the components are. Well, they explicitly consider some elements of political risk, both quantitatively and qualitatively. These are now widely used by uh, not only bond markets, but also stock markets, individual investors, companies thinking of making new investments, uh, and the insurance industry, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, toward the end of this talk. Uh, if you look at the recent stuff, uh, there are ratings for about 70 countries. That's really quite a lot, but they're really only available since about the year 2000. Some countries, like the United States, have been rated uh, for decades, but uh, most of the countries that you would be interested in, say, for your class on, on managing and developing countries, sorry, uh, you would really be restricted to a recent period, probably starting in the year 2000. Uh, the good news is that these ratings are usually free, and you can either see these on the internet or you can go to Gelman Library or something in order to. Uh, look up even some of the reports. They'll give you a country report and talk about the, uh, the characteristics that went into the rating, even if they don't show you the quantitative model used to establish all ratings. These ratings then become a benchmark for any other ratings that they would do in the country. A typical scenario would be where a company in one of these countries would then be interested in issuing a bond, possibly available to, to domestic borrowers, some possibly available just to international borrowers. Uh, but they would seek a rating for their corporate bond issue as a way to signal what the industry thinks the level of risk associated with that is. And so if you compare the corporate bond to the country or the sovereign bond, the prevailing wisdom is that the government in any country is probably the least risky borrower, and the companies there would probably not have higher bond ratings than the government, uh, because the level of credit risk is just generally higher. Uh, if there's a currency crisis, then it's less likely that private firms would be able to serve their debt. Uh, compared to the government, obviously the government uh, relying on the power of taxation in order to raise its, uh, its, its money to repay some of these loans. So in the lingo here, 
Uh, the sovereign country rating serves as a ceiling for all of the non-sovereign ratings. And then one final note is that the industry has become quite sophisticated in distinguishing the currency risk. You can have uh, two bonds issued by, say, the same government or even the same firm. If one is in dollars and one is in local currency, they obviously have different levels of risk. If they're identical in all other regards, the only difference is this currency risk. Uh, but the prevailing thought here is that if you're borrowing, if you're in a foreign country and you're borrowing dollars, it's probably harder to service that. And so you would have a lower credit rating on a dollar denominated bond than you would on a local currency bond. So if you're in the Philippines and you're considering borrowing, compare operations in pesos versus the operations in dollars, a uh, bond denominated in dollars is probably riskier. The same is true for the government as well, uh, and so there's some effort to make the distinction between the, the, the currency of denomination of these bonds. Well, these have become much more useful uh, in a broad perspective. Uh, it sounds, again, like the notion of a bond is a very specific financial instrument, and all we're worried about is default. Uh, but in, in a capital market equilibrium, bonds and the rate of return on bonds have to be related to equities and the rate of return on equities, and it has to be related to uh, any financial intermediation through bank loans, and it has to be related to a general level of profitability from any kind of investment. And so by considering this kind of hierarchy, we can actually learn a lot by looking at the bonds and making inferences about what happens to the rate of return on any investment. And ultimately, no matter what business you're in, you care about the rate of return on this investment. So one thing you can do is consider the interest rate spread between two bonds as some measure of the risk premium for doing business in a particular country. And so what I have in mind here is if you start with the easy thing, uh, suppose you have a choice between making an investment in the United States and making an investment in the Philippines. And you notice that the rate of return on a bond issued by the US government is say 4%, and the rate of return issued by a bond, uh, sorry, issued by, the rate of return on a bond issued by the Philippine government is 9%. That difference, 9 minus 4, is 5, and that could be interpreted as a risk premium exclusively for political risk. If both bonds are denominated in dollars, if they both have the same term structure, then the only thing that's different is who's borrowing, right? One is the government of the Philippines. Uh, and then if you have differences in the currency so that the dollar bond might be compared to a peso bond, well, that would tell you something about the combination of the sovereign risk and the currency risk, right? But if you're going to the Philippines, you might be dealing in pesos anyway, and that might be a relevant comparison to you. Well, that again is not the exact topic for today, but you have a sense of how we would be able to arrive at a risk premium associated with this country risk. And that probably embodies a lot of different elements. But you'll notice that those interest rates, which are generally observable, right? I mean, you can open the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal and then figure out what the rate of return on a US dollar bond is issued by the US government, and then a similar bond issued by the Philippine government. Those interest rates are widely available. And so it conveys information. Those interest rates are actually determined in uh, market transactions in what's typically thought of as an efficient market. So the sense is that the market sets these interest rates. They set it partly in regard to what the credit rating agencies have labeled the level of credit risk, right? Uh, so we're using the information from the credit rating agencies in markets to establish this interest rate. Well, this raises the question then, uh, if we're relying on the markets to set the interest rate and then we try to figure out the cost of political risk or the cost of country risk as the interest rate difference, then we ought to be able to just focus on the interest rate 
and not worry about what the credit rating is, right? Okay. Uh, and so there is now, even among these rating agencies, a move toward these market-based ratings. I think that to give you a little bit more background, uh, the issue became a lot more important after the Asian financial crisis in 1996 and 1997, just because uh, the credit rating agencies seemed not to understand the currency crisis until it was all over. Uh, then there were studies suggesting that, well, the way the credit rating agencies behaved was generally to deny that there was a problem until the problem was obvious. And then once the problem was obvious, to cut the ratings way too much so that they would then come back up uh, when the market actually more appropriately discounted any of the bonds on those, uh, for those sovereigns. And so uh, this is a term that you'll hear quite a lot if you pursue anything with regard to political risk, this notion of market-based ratings. Now, that's not the only uh, single country index. Uh, I think those are widely used. Uh, but the Institutional Investor magazine has actually been working on this for a very long time. Uh, you see this referred to in many studies because the database is relatively large. This is a slightly different approach. Instead of having a model, and you feed in model and then tweak it with some judgment at the end, you just survey a bunch of banks. And these banks are widely presumed to have their own models because they're engaged in bank lending to these countries. Uh, and so the composite score is based on some unspecified weights, but weights determined by the level of sophistication of the bank's model and the amount of exposure that a bank has to foreign lending. And so it's basically just a scale of creditworthiness, right? And we don't know. People say that they use political indicators, economic indicators. We don't actually know what they use. Uh, so we're compiling things more based on the survey. These are available for free. You basically can find the issues in Gelman Library once again. Uh, this is a fairly well-known magazine. And I think that the an initial motivation to do this was to have some forum where bankers could actually discuss these credit risk issues. Uh, subsequently, now you'll see that these actually date back to 1979. During the 1980s, many, many sovereigns defaulted on their bank loans in what was known as essentially the LDC debt crisis. And after 1979, after 1983, 1984, uh, banks actually had to, in the United States, ramp up their analytical divisions in order to investigate this. And so uh, the institutional investor was a pretty good place to start. Well, again, presumably the banks were conferring and exchanging some information and that the interest rates on bank loans were set according to this creditworthiness index, much like if you went to a bank and asked for a loan, they would consult your credit score before deciding whether to give you a loan and then secondly, setting the interest rate on the loan. Uh, and so uh, there is some sense that the usefulness is there, although we don't have public information on what all of these uh, bank interest rates are. So uh, there's not much more that we can do with that. And then. The industry kept growing, and most of the things listed on this slide came after 1979, not necessarily all of them, uh, but approached this issue of country risk a little bit differently. Instead of wanting some general level of risk indication for a country as a whole, build a country risk indicator based on a bunch of different building blocks. And so, Euro Money is also a magazine, and so this is available free in Gelman Library, uh, decided to begin constructing its index of country risk using a series of components. I think it's about eight, actually. Uh, but I, since I'm focusing here on political risk, I know for sure that 25% of the final index is actually this political risk component, uh, the remaining 75 being just economic and financial indicators. 
The Economist Intelligence Unit, this is The Economist magazine that you might be familiar with. Uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit has a specific division for Country Risk Service and a publication known as Risk Ratings Review. Their country risk is 22% political risk, uh, with the remainder basically economic and financial risk. Uh, the Business Environment Risk Intelligence Corporation uh, has a profit opportunity recommendation that is one-third political risk. Uh, and the International Country Risk Guide, which I'll spend a little bit more time on, uh, is 50% political risk. Now the advantage of all of these is that you can separate out the political risk indicator uh, and look at that and try to figure out what information is contained in that. And so the Euro money political risk component is again a survey. There's nothing controversial about this. It's a survey of country experts, brokers, banking officers, and, and the like on a 25-point scale. But it's specifically referred to as the risk of impaired payment for goods or services, loans, trade-related finance and dividends, or repatriation of capital. Very finance-oriented. And so it might be a very narrow interpretation of political risk, uh, suggesting that political risk itself is poorly defined and people just don't agree on uh, what the main definition should be. Uh, these ratings are actually available back to 1988, sorry, 1997, although uh, complete country indices are available back to 1988. Uh, and that, uh, again, one advantage of this, along with the Institutional Investor Index, is that it, it covers almost every country in the world. And so if you're doing something on the cross-section, uh, you get a lot further here than paying attention to Moody's and Standard and & Poor's. Well, that is a survey of political risk. Here, the Economist Intelligence Unit actually approaches things a little bit differently. Uh, they have country experts. And... <clears throat> If you read their stuff carefully, they have people, they have several people covering the same country, but any individual person covers several countries. So there's some logic to this. And so on average, they really only have about one person who is an expert on one country. But that might be enough, right? And they ask all of their experts to fill out a questionnaire that includes some questions on well, not only economic and financial stuff, I mean, they do have a database of this, but also political stability and political effectiveness. Now, I'm going to shift back and forth here. Political stability involves questions to the expert, like basically one expert, on war, social unrest, orderly political transfer, politically motivated violence, and international disputes. The questions on political effectiveness are on change in government and pro-business orientation combined, institutional effectiveness, bureaucracy, transparency or fairness, corruption, and crime. Now, those are much more in line with things that we would think about as political risk variables than simply asking a bunch of you know, country experts, what the probability of, you know, not getting your money back is, right? And so these are somehow combined into a 100-point scale for each individual country. These are available monthly. And so one, one advantage of this is that they're available at, uh, with greater frequency than most of the alternatives. And so there's a monthly survey uh, for approximately 100 countries. And uh, they sell not only the total country risk rating, they sell the political risk rating, but they sell the ratings for all 10 of those variables. And so if you want to, say, change the weights or you want to focus on uh, just two or three of those as most appropriate for your own investment, uh, then they're more than happy to sell you the database. Uh, and I, I would characterize this as not really expensive, uh, but it means... Uh, probably several thousand dollars, and specifically you will not find this at Gelman Library. And so uh, there is some available information, but uh, not the systematic approach to all of these indicators.
Okay, uh, and I guess on a side note, I think this is really taking off. Um, it hasn't been available for a long time, but I think partly because of their reputation in the area. They've been doing country risk analysis for a very long time. This is simply a new form and a new database, uh, and so I think it's actually taking off uh, fairly rapidly. Now, um, there are alternatives. Uh, Barry is this business environment risk intelligence, a private company. Uh, and this seems to be expensive, actually. I was digging around to try to find anything, and, and most libraries don't have anything from Barry. And then when you look at their website, they don't really discuss pricing information, uh, which I interpret to be a signal that it's expensive, right? Uh, this is largely geared for foreign lending by banks, and I think that that's not always well understood. But again, the company basically served the needs of banks engaged in foreign lending. The political risk index is based on 10 variables, and that these are harder for me to read, right? So fortunately, you have these in front of you. Uh, but you see words here about fractionalization of society, fractionalization by language or religion, uh, some kind of coercive measures that may be required for the government to retain power, uh, some measures of social mentality, uh, attitudes toward foreigners or nationalism, uh, social conditions, uh, the strength of forces for a radical government. I think what they're thinking of is sort of a, the possibility of some major change. Uh, dependence on uh, foreign power for some kind of, wait, dependence on and or importance to a major hostile power. Uh, I guess either support or hostile. Uh, the negative influences of regional political forces, societal conflict as measured by strikes, demonstrations, street violence, uh, and even instability as possibly measured by guerrilla wars and assassinations. And we're getting clearly into the realm of political science. I know plenty of people in this field who are political scientists and collect data on political assassinations and uh, try to interpret the level of political risk based on that. Uh, other people uh, use more widely developed measures, say, simply of urbanization to indicate some level of social unrest, uh, because prior research has generally suggested that the more urban an area, the more unrest there is. Okay, uh, and so this is dependent upon, again, a survey. There are 100 experts that are surveyed, and the results, although it's not a simple adding up, but let's just say, ultimately, the results are presented on a 100-point scale. These are done three times per year for 50 countries and once per year for 50 other countries. Uh, and so you don't have necessarily the same consistency with data availability, uh, but you know, you've got a, a fair number of countries. Uh, and Remember, this is what I earlier referred to as a sort of profit opportunity recommendation. Uh, the other parts of this overall country risk or profit opportunity recommendation include an operations risk index and a remittance and repatriation factor, uh, each of those also worth one third. And when you look at the factors that go into these, you kind of think that, you know, there are a lot of things there that are based on political risk also, right? And so it would be something like uh, the, the risk of a change in labor unionization, right? Well, that could conceivably be construed as something about political risk. Uh, and remittance and repatriation factors are basically more in line with the finance, financial and economic approaches. Well, what is the risk, you know, even politically, that capital controls or currency controls will be imposed? Well. Uh, and so I think this might adequately be explained as an almost exclusive uh, political risk approach, uh, although they've got different definitions within there. All right. And then uh, the last one that I actually am much more familiar with, um, although this is available for purchase and it's not, well, it's not for free in Gelman Library. It's also not terribly expensive, and so I think a lot of people pursuing research in this area are using this database. I know that 
Uh, other institutions around Washington, D.C. use this database as well. Uh, and the fascinating part of this is that it's basically back to a mechanical approach. There are 12 variables, and the weights are explicit in the construction of the political risk index. Uh, they measure government stability, socioeconomic conditions, investment profile, internal conflict, and external conflict. And each one of these is weighted at 12%. Corruption, military and politics, religious tensions, law and order, and ethnic tensions, and democratic accountability are all weighted at 6%. And then the quality of the bureaucracy has a 4% weight. I think these are, again, the kinds of variables that people would think of as a political risk component. Other variables would be in the category of economic and financial risk. Uh, and so some of these can be measured. Uh, there are often surveys of corruption, for example. There are a lot of different organizations looking at corruption. Uh, some of these have to be subjectively scaled somehow. Well, these 12 variables are basically assessed by the ICRG staff. Uh, and so they rely on full-time staff and some stringers to provide information. Uh, these are also presented, ultimately, the political risk index is presented on a 100-point scale. Uh, and this has a, a, a long history uh, dating back to 1984 for approximately 150 countries. Uh, and so I think one of the advantages, again, is this long time series available, uh, and this is actually also available monthly. Uh, the, the changes month to month are not dramatic, but uh, because they've got a staff working on this, there's a monthly indicator of each one of those variables. Uh, and if you want the subcomponents, you can actually buy those as well. Now, uh, to make a few comments about all of those indices where the country risk is built from the building blocks. I'll make some general statements uh, about trying to figure out what the importance of the information is. Like, what exactly do these contain? Well, in the field of finance, uh, people want to know if any of these variables, say the political risk variables, are priced, right? Uh, because part of the debate is even this debate about how much we should be worrying about political risk. And so with regard to stock market performance, does political risk contribute to the overall risk of the stock market? Or even a U.S. company operating in a foreign country with, say, a separate class of shares that would be issued tied to the operations in that foreign country? Uh, would that kind of stock be priced according to some political risk variables? Well, I think the debate is ongoing, but most people have now concluded that political risk cannot be diversified, so most of these variables are priced somehow. So in much the same way that we already talked about a risk premium associated with the bond, people are finding a risk premium associated with stocks. And then from the managerial standpoint, this tells you something about your cost of capital of operating in that country. Uh, if there's a risk premium on the bonds and a risk premium on the stocks, then there's got to be a risk premium for your assets in general. And so this will tell you, once again, uh, approximately how much additional profitability it would be required on an investment in one of these risky countries. And so if you've got a choice between putting your plant in the US or the Philippines, right? you're going to consider a lot of different variables. Uh, some inputs may be cheaper in the Philippines, uh, but there will be additional risks, presumably. So what you want to know is well, exactly how much additional profitability, what's the rate of return on my assets got to be? And there is actually uh, more research on the rate of return for these kinds of assets and whether the assets in riskier countries uh, have a higher rate of return? The general answer, I think, is yes, as you should not be surprised, right? I think that even without, you know, rigorous debate about whether political risk can be diversified, you would basically be tempted to make sure there was a higher rate of return on the Philippines in order to compensate for the risk of doing business on the Philippines as opposed to doing business in the United States. <laughs>
Okay, and so many people have used these indices, and I would say that uh, you can use these in proprietary ways. Uh, if you're interested in, say, the value of oil reserves, right? You don't have to value the entire company. You just value the oil reserves. And so you'd be interested in answering a question like, how much of a discount should I apply to an oil reserve that I'm thinking about purchasing because it's in a riskier country, right? You can think about a nice story contrasting the U.S. and Russia, right? The U.S. is much safer than Russia, uh, but a lot of the oil that both countries have is actually right next to each other up right outside of Alaska. And so you can ask an interesting question about, well, how much would this oil field be worth if it were on the other side of the line, right? If it were in the United States? Uh, or how much of a discount should I apply? The oil is the same, it just happens to be in a different jurisdiction. Uh, and so I know people who are working on that, too. Uh, and finally, I've got a couple of indicators here about uh, political risk ratings only. Uh, and I actually, this is a, not a wide area, but some firms are trying to carve out their own niche specializing in political risk as opposed to all economic and financial risk as essentially being pretty well developed already. Uh, this CRG, the Control Risks Group, has a country risk forecast. And then I'll also mention something about the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. This is an independent agency of the U.S. government, but I'm using it as some broadly representative insurance agent, right? OPIC sells insurance on U.S. capital invested abroad. Uh, but there are private suppliers of this insurance, uh, and there are even some uh, alternatives, the World Bank has an arm, MIGA, uh, that does effectively the same thing. And so if you're thinking about one of the ways that you can actually manage the kind of political risk that you're worried about, you can buy political risk insurance. Okay, now with this CRG group, the Control Risk Group, uh, there is a rating. I, th I would characterize this as just a general rating, it's got a five point scale, and so you have a sense of whether it's risky or not very risky. There are 20 analysts at CRG with backgrounds in history, economics, regional studies, and political science. And they effectively, I guess, independently and then collectively decide what of those five buckets a particular country would be in. And they consider political risk, security risk, and travel risk. Uh, political risk being political stability, economic stability, and campaign issues. Security risk being violent and terrorist groups, crime, border conflict, and war. Uh, the travel risk being crime, possibility of strikes, terrorism, and war conditions. Uh, but again, it's relying on analysts to put each one of these in the appropriate bucket, uh, and then some combination of the three forming the overall country risk forecast. OPEC is engaged in an assessment of political risk exclusively because it sells insurance on this. And they haven't got complete information, but this is public available information on their website. They don't have complete pricing details, but they tell you things about the cost of insurance to insure against the inconvertibility of the currency, right? Well, that's again, mostly an economic thing, right? But if you can't convert your Philippine pesos back into US dollars, it's like you've lost your money. And this is 20 to 45 basis points. And so uh, one basis point is one one hundredth of a percent. And so you would tell them how much you're expecting to convert, and then they would sell you the insurance on that amount to convert. They also sell the insurance on expropriation and nationalization, these extreme outcomes. Uh, they are also fairly adept at figuring out, well, okay, we're insuring not only the assets, right? You can insure the assets, so it's the value of the factory, uh, but also some of the future stream of profits, right? Because we know that you're there to make an investment that has an income stream over time. This is in the range of 35 to 85 basis points. And uh, 
the insurance on political violence, which would be war damage or civil strife, uh, or civil strife damage, uh, is in the range of 30 to 85 basis points. And that these are the three main categories. If you can fit your political risk concerns into one of these three categories, you can insure against it. There are also more general insurances available. If you just want to insure against uh, interruption of business, right? Well, somebody will sell you insurance, possibly OPEC. It's just not one of their predefined categories. Uh, the risk premium here also depends on what industry you're in, manufacturing versus uh, oil and gas versus other extractive industries, even service industries, and there are a couple of others there as well. Um, and this as an independent government agency is effectively trying to set what might be a market premium, but admits that they wouldn't even be doing this if the market for this kind of insurance existed and was completely efficient already. Over time, it makes sense that other insurers will be willing to insure against political risk. And so you have more attention, once again, to these market-based ratings and analysis. On the whole, I'd say there is some indication of what the cost of expropriation would be, because you see what they're quoting for a particular insurance policy, right? Uh, but we don't know that that's perfectly priced, right? And so you may want to, I guess, first compare, shop around a little. And then secondly, you'll notice that I focused on, on what's available here. Uh, they don't tell you what the price is by country, right? And it's partly because, as an independent agency of the U.S. government, they're basically interested in guaranteeing U.S. capital invested abroad, but they also don't want to get into the business of discriminating across countries. So although they don't say this, uh, the U.S. government maintains a country risk assessment system of which they are a part. And so my guess is that although they don't, they don't tell you exactly how this is this, the risk premium is the insurance premium for risk is determined. It's probably grounded in the interagency country risk assessment system. So now that private insurers are available, they have a little bit more uh, competition. They have a little bit more sense that they need to set the price not only according to the characteristics of the industry, but also the characteristics of the country, right? Uh, and then they also need to figure out, well, okay, if I, if I sell the insurance policy at a below market rate, then I got to figure out what the risk to me really is, what the risk to the U.S. government is, and they have to report that separately, uh, but really only to Congress in, in an aggregate. And so uh, it, they're effectively running an insurance business, uh, and I think that that means they're competing against other insurance businesses, uh, but they don't have the same profit orientation that other insurance businesses have. Okay, and then this is my last slide. As a, as a set of concluding comments, I've presented the indicators, and I guess I want to conclude by saying that these are basically highly correlated. This should not surprise you. Everybody claims they're measuring about the same thing. They'll have their own niche, right? We have an index of corruption, right? And so then you go out and you measure the cost of corruption. Or we have an index forecasting the change in government, something like that. Or we have an index that simply estimates the probability that you're not going to get your money if you send an invoice uh, and want payment within 90 days, right? But because they're estimating generally the same thing, country and political risk, they are positively correlated. They're not perfectly correlated, but you would be interested in using all available information if you were engaged in a new investment abroad. Secondly, and I, I don't offer a lot of proof here, but the political risk ratings are typically highly correlated with the economic and financial ratings. With the Euro Money Index, and this shouldn't surprise you because it's probably the overstatement, right? With the, Euro, with the Euro Money Index, we already said that their definition of political risk was basically 
anything that might include capital controls and currency controls or just I'm feeling like I'm not willing to repay you, right? And so uh, that would effectively be a lot like all the economic and political variables. The correlation between the political index and the economic and financial index across countries is 0.9. They're effectively measuring the same thing. This has been an interesting debate, right? Because if you've got two indices, one called a political risk index and one called the economic and financial risk index, and they're highly correlated, there's a question of you know, exactly how much information is in, say, the political risk index that isn't available in the other thing. Well, people have investigated this, actually, and, and not, not recently. I mean, this has been over the last decade or so. And I've found that generally these indices are all highly correlated with per capita income. If you're a rich country, you have a high credit rating, you've got a very low probability of default, uh, you've got low political risk. Uh, if you're a low per capita income country, you got all the problems associated with, say, being a low per capita income country. And so you've got a lot more political risk and a lot less uh, economic and financial stability. And so there have been studies that suggest things like the amount of additional information provided by any of these indices that would not be captured by simply looking at the per capita income level in a country is probably minimal. It's, you know, in a typical regression format where you're trying to dissect the in influence of one thing and another, per capita income easily explains the majority of all variation in these indices. And so, it's rather difficult to disentangle the various effects or even to decide which one of these measures is best, uh, but the search goes on. People are perpetually interested in political risk and insuring against it or getting a leg up on the competition by adequately forecasting it. Okay, so that's all I have for my prepared remarks, and there's still time for some questions at either one of the microphones. Okay, you're first. Do any of the indices that you uh, spoke about take into account that political risk could be greater for an investor originating in one country as opposed to the other, or are they all from a, a Western investor point of view? Yes, this is an excellent question. These are mostly from the Western standpoint. And if you think about Euro money versus some of the others, Euro money actually has a more European perspective and uh, wouldn't necessarily apply to an American making an investment in that country. Uh, the main theory behind this, though, is that capital markets should be integrated globally. And so if you start with the proposition that uh, the movement of capital really doesn't depend on where the capital comes from, it only depends on where the capital goes, right? Uh, then there is a broad applicability of all of these. However, it is true that uh, if you think that part of the risk is this liability of foreignness that I started with, that locals may not encounter at all, then an important distinction really should be made between you know, the outside capital versus the inside capital, or outside investors trying to run an operation versus the insiders. Beyond that, I guess there, there are investigations, mostly on the level of case studies, that may suggest, say, why people from one country wouldn't face uh, the same level of ri risk as people from another country going into a third country. Uh, but none of these indicators that I've talked about today consider that. I think a couple of the producers of these would be willing to sell you consulting services for this, uh, but I also am not convinced that they would have anything uh, really intelligent to say. Uh, but, sorry. But uh, I think it's something for you to think about when you decide how to structure an investment, for example, right? If you go in with a local partner, that may change the risk completely, right? And so uh, anything you can do to mitigate the risk means that what you're doing is not considering a countrywide level of risk, but your firm-specific level of risk. That's a great question. It's a subject of great debate. Okay, how about this side? <laughs> 
Uh, how do these risk rating organizations account for information that might be highly protected with, within a developing country? That's a good question. Um, most of these agencies rely on publicly available information. Now, the rating agencies are able to use any information provided by the government uh, as long as they conform to, say, industry standards to protect that information and verify the credibility of that information. Uh, and the fact that experts are making judgments in a lot of cases means that they might have some you know, proprietary or inside information or something, some information that's highly protected. Uh, but by and large, they're just exercising their judgment on that particular issue and how it might fit into political risk. They wouldn't have restrictions on this. They may even relish the fact that they have inside information. Uh, but I guess, you know, if the central bank isn't willing to tell you the amount of international reserves, then you probably have to work around it, right? Mm -hmm. If they tell you confidentially, then you probably can't just plug it into your model, but you might be able to exercise the judgment that would effectively put it into the model uh, as if you could put it in, something like that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, my question is actually related to the previous one. Um, it's been noted that political risk analysis is a lot more subjective and consequently um, more vulnerable to bias, especially since much of it's gathered you know, on site by individuals who have their own political views. Are you aware of any mechanisms that are currently in place to counteract that effect, or if you could make any suggestions of those that should be introduced to kind of diminish some of the subjectivity? Uh, yeah, okay, wow. Um, <laughs> in many ways, you sound like me. Like, subjectivity is evil, right? Because we want hard facts. Uh, most of these indices try to take subjective judgment and quantify it. That's effectively what we're doing when we ask an expert, uh, well, you know what's going on in the region. How do you think this is going to affect corruption or something, right? Uh, and so there are mechanisms to deal with you know, general surveys or surveys of experts and all of that. Much of the recent quantitative approach to this has tried to figure out you know, on something like corruption, what exactly are we measuring, right? And so trying to put more quantitative emphasis in an area where people have some judgment, uh, but I, I don't think you'll ever solve the problem of having some level of subjectivity. I think what people are interested in, say, in the insurance industry is, does this level of subjectivity tell me anything about my possible losses if I've made insurance policies against expropriation, right? And if it does, then it's valued even if it can't be quantified. Uh, and I think that a lot of other, I mean, this was focused on the indices that are basically summaries of a lot of other things, uh, but a lot of political risk consulting doesn't even offer a quantitative approach. And so I think that if you're, willing to acknowledge that the subjective really just means judgment. You've got to find people with good judgment to advise you on something, like any business decision. Uh, then I think there are plenty of alternatives. I don't have any big solution for removing biases, uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on that, actually. Wow, great questions, though. OK, how about this side? How effective are these risk forecasts for companies looking to invest in developing countries, particularly when some of the component risk factors, such as corruption, often go undocumented in many of these developing countries? OK. Uh, so the notion here is forecasting that I'm going to seize on first. Most of these purport to be forward-looking, for sure. So when I was talking about the, the bond ratings, this is like a 20-year horizon. Uh, something like the ICRG index has different horizons, but basically is thinking about a long run horizon in some 10-year you know, context, although they also offer some judgment of what the short run risk is versus a longer run risk, so something for the next three. Now, uh, the notion of many of the effects being undocumented is in many ways just back to the question of judgment and trying to exert 
some level of judgment based on partial information, uh, knowing what you know from being in a particular location. How accurate that is, uh, is very difficult to study, right? Because it probably means, well, kind of what you're saying is the forecast is undocumented, right? Like you ask me about corruption, but who's going to document that and who's going to do it systematically over a long period of time uh, in a lot of different countries? Well, we have some indices that try to get at something like that. Um, and they're forward looking, but I'll go back to even the Asian financial crisis. That was not well predicted. Most of the extreme events that you would see covered in the press are not well predicted to begin with. Uh, and so an expropriation or something, you might have a sense, right? You might begin to require a higher rate of return on your investments. Uh, you may curtail additional investment, but ultimately uh, the decision to expropriate is probably not a subject of great public policy discussion in the years leading up to the expropriation, right? It's usually enacted you know, in the middle of the night uh, and announced with marshals the next morning. Right? Now that's a bit, bit of an extreme, uh, but I think that partly because the quantitative element is not pervasive, uh, it's hard to figure out what the accuracy or reliability of any of these forecasts is. I think that the best that we can do is simply acknowledge that using all available information now, I have a good sense of what kind of discount I want to apply to a particular foreign project uh, for a variety of reasons. That's good, though, because I haven't said anything about um, forecasting. She stole your question? OK. My question's a little bit related to the first one. And I'm wondering about a recent trend where you see particularly US companies and firms and Western companies show a hesitant to invest in countries where there is high political risk uh -huh. and instability. But then you see other countries, such as China, very willing and openly investing in countries, you know, recently, especially in Africa. And I'm wondering, is China using a different scale and different factors? And is the U.S. missing out on these investment opportunities? Or is the U.S. being wiser in its choices? I don't know. <laughs> it's actually a really good question. Uh, you're right. Now, the framework would suggest that if Americans have some disadvantage particular, some disadvantage going into Africa that the Chinese don't have, then yeah, they should be using a different scale or evaluating the projects a little bit differently. Uh, and I can tell you, now this is not a statement about China or Africa or anybody else, but there has been a lot of discussion lately about the nature of investment and where the capital comes from. If a particular country is really good at dealing with corruption already, for example, uh, then it'll be more willing to go into a country where it has to deal with corruption than a, a, con than a company from a country where, we're not, where they may not be dealing with corruption. Uh, but people have actually tried to estimate this uh, even empirically, right? You got a measure of corruption from one country, a, mu a measure of corruption from another country, and a measure of corruption in this third country. What's more likely? And it seems that a general trend is it's more likely for the capital com to come to this corrupt country uh, from another corrupt country rather than from a clean country. And so maybe, maybe that makes sense, actually, that what matters is not the absolute level of corruption here, but the difference between the two. And so you can get those kinds of results from these existing databases, even though I didn't present it like that. Thank you. That's a great question. These are all great questions. Sort of in the same vein, back in the 1970s in China, Deng Xiaoping started initiating uh, economic autonomous regions. So my question is, what type of, of uh, government or economic policies do you think China should continue to implement in order to allow their economy to grow, have a positive effect on the global economy, while also trying to maintain a level political risk structure. OK. I'm not an expert on China. I have colleagues who are. And so I've never worked in China. I 
what I know is essentially that it's not a complete free market system and that some of the reforms uh, would appropriately, in my eyes, uh, lead them toward a more free market system where prices and exchange rates are determined uh, by market forces and supply and demand. Uh, beyond that, I don't have any great wisdom on that specific country. I'm sorry. No, thank you. Okay. I apologize in advance. This is kind of a long-winded question. <coughs> <clears throat> It seems as if all of the indices used take a developed nation's point of view. Uh, this could be because uh, most investment comes from these areas and that most indices that are used are created by organizations with heavy influence from developed nations. However, do you think it is necessary to create an index with which investors can understand the country within its own context using factors such as government investment into inter infrastructure, transpar transparency of the nation's educational system, and investment from the nation into other developed nations. Uh, as a foreign investor's money that is invested into this nation, or even its business, could become an integral part of the future of that developing nation. OK. Um, this is, again, this is a good question. You're exactly right. The starting point was essentially that these indices are predominantly from a Western perspective. And I think they do incorporate the kind of variables that you've talked about. Uh, the, the notion behind this index is that there's some kind of cross-country study, right? You, you're comparing the risk in one country against another, although many of these exist over time as well. And what we want to do is try to figure out, well, what exactly did this investment in infrastructure do for the economic and political environment in this country, and then we'll adjust our rating accordingly. I actually don't see a, well, I, I don't see a problem with the existing indices from that perspective, but I also would admit that if there are country-specific concerns that don't seem to show up quantitatively, then you have gotta try to take account of them subjectively or qualitatively uh, and that if there's still some piece that's unexplained, then you should investigate it. And so it might be some of the exact variables that you've mentioned. Uh, is, is, is that about what you have in mind? I mean, I twisted your question around to essentially fit, fit, no, no, fit it, my own perspective. Well, it just seemed that many of the factors that are used, uh, you know, in the different indices, they, you know, they are very similar and they create a kind of a level playing field for which you can analyze different nations within the world as a whole. But it also seems that every nation has their own specific context with, the, with you know, within they can operate within. And just because, you know, it seems like from a Western nation or a developed nation, mm -hmm. that you can look at those different factors. If you look within the country itself and maybe, you know, its possibilities and potential, that you can greatly, you know, maybe better assess the uh, possibility for investment and its viability in the long term. Yeah, I actually, I think you're onto something. Um, you know, from my previous studies, any of these indices that look at, say, government spending, you know, high government spending is evil, right? Because it means the government's bloated and all of that. But, you know, if they're investing in the infrastructure in that particular context, high government spending is probably a good thing, right? And so by trying to compare high government spending in one country to a high government spending in another country, you might actually be capturing the exact wrong thing. You want to evaluate it within this particular context. That, I, I think you're right. I think that may be part of the motivation for these firms to begin selling all the separate components so that you can, you can analyze these and manipulate them as you'd like. And I guess, again, your general proposition is right. All the same variables in a different location may have completely different outcomes, uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, I, I don't think any of these address that, but it's, again, from the perspective that Capital is capital, and what we care about is what the rate of return is and that kind of stuff. It's actually, it's a great question. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. One more. Uh, in regards to any rapidly developing country, whether it be China, Mexico, Brazil, or whatever, they're all operating and expanding rapidly in a culture of corruption. But at the same time, they're, or a little bit at least, uh, at the same time, the developed countries are trying to, through these indices and through research, trying to exert their influence on them to try and have them straighten their act out in a way. 
Now, my question is, do you think that that influence or that exertion or that pressure on those rapidly expanding developing countries could lead to a possible fallout or bottom out or a potential crash? And if so, what would the ramifications of that be? Yeah, I think that you could have some extreme pushback, right? That if, if the person investing the capital tries to control too much, uh, so that you know, multilateral agencies are trying to get you to root out corruption and all of that, uh, there could be a backlash. I think the only thing to protect yourself against that is to not invest there in the first place. And so that's one of the goals of the US in, the sen in this new Millennium Challenge Corporation. We want you to clean up your act, and as you're cleaning up your act, we'll do certain things to get more capital in. Uh, but I think a likely outcome uh, which deserves a lot of attention, is that they'll simply clean up their act, or if they don't clean up their act, everything will explode and you'll never get your money back. Uh, in most of these, you just have to figure out the probabilities of those two scenarios and, and anything in between. I do think that the optimism of investing in a developing country has now been mitigated somewhat by a lot of these kinds of concerns from a purely investment standpoint, I think we know that there are going to be, that there are going to be problems. There could be severe backlash from, from all of this. And so it's on a technical level. Well, how far do you think we'll get in reforming the corruption, right? We may not get all the way, and then we might have to stop, right? Because we know that if we go the one next step, we lose everything. And so we go as far as we can. That's kind of just the practical approach to all of this. Uh, but, you know, you know nevertheless, um, we want to we want to well, abide by the law as much as possible. Uh, and if that means that we just don't want to get involved in a particularly corrupt area, we'll let some other country deal with it. OK. Thanks. Um, while each of the indices rate, um, while each of the indices rates the political factors and risks, how would you rec recommend that a potential investor use this information along with other social factors and ongoing reforms being instituted by local government and foreign NGOs? Like, how would they use it um, in addition yeah, to Yeah, again, this is like the big, yeah, the big picture question, right? To, to me, it's a little answer uh, because all I care about is what kind of risk premium I would need to satisfy for operating there, right? And how would I use this information? Well, if I noticed that having a local partner would reduce the risk, uh, then I'd just do a cost-benefit trade-off. Like, having a local partner may cost me something, right? But if the local partner brings something to the investment, then I'd restructure the investment in order to account for a local partner and thereby reduce the overall risk of the whole thing. I think that this is kind of at the level of analyzing the particular investment that you want. If what you're worried about is corruption, we, we focus that on that topic quite a bit, uh, then you'd want to figure out a way to make sure you're not subject to as much demand for bribes or something. Part of that could be going in with a local partner. Or alternatively, uh, trying to figure out you know, adjusting for this cost, just price it in, right? If, if I'm gonna be shaken down a lot, then just make sure I build that in into the uh, required expenditures as part of the investment, something like that. Um, but I, I guess I've made the mistake of keeping this at a general level, the notion being you're comparing an investment opportunity here to one in a different country, and I wanna consider the level of political risk. Anything you can do to alter that level of risk beyond what I've talked about, right? Beyond the level of a countrywide risk, uh, then you'll you'll basically be man managing, exercising your managerial discretion appropriately. 